black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me. And this look of, I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was, he was, he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? See ya. Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. Is Sasquatch in the UK? We'll find out tonight when we talk to Andy McGrath. He's the author of Beasts of Britain. If you get a chance, go to Amazon and check it out. Uh, Beast of Britain. Andy's been looking into reports. And he brought us tonight reports of Dogman, Sasquatch, uh, all the stuff he's gotten from the UK. Should be a fascinating night. Uh, if you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance to check out sasquatchchronicles.com, you can become a member and get additional shows. Before we get to Andy, I want to jump to Chad. And Chad actually had a pretty recent encounter in Arkansas. Uh, Chad is actually current military. Didn't really believe in Bigfoot had some friends that asked him to go out with them and they had a lot of strange things happen that night chad welcome to the show thanks for coming on hey what's going on Wes? oh not a whole lot man i appreciate you being here and i know your encounter took place in arkansas a couple years back uh if you would would you start from the beginning kind of tell us what you were doing and walk us into what happened if you would yeah 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 definitely so um went home on leave Back in 2015, I was stationed in Georgia, and uh, I'm a native to Arkansas, and uh, went home on leave back around May of 2015 to go visit my my family during my um, my brother's high school graduation. And uh, my brother reached out to me. He's like, "Hey, man, we're going up to this uh, mountain with a group of guys, and um, they're Bigfoot hunters." And I was like, "Wait, what? Come on!" He was like, "Yeah, yeah, man. Like, it's it's legit." I was like, "All right, whatever. I've got nothing going on." So I got with you and hang out with you. And uh, so I didn't have a vehicle because I flew in. So I persuaded my dad, like, hey, can I can I take your, your truck? He's like, yeah, yeah, go, go for it. Just, you know, keep it clean. Be careful. I just bought it. I was like, yeah, yeah, no worries. So we, we followed these two other guys up this mountain. And it took about, let's see, about four hours just to get up the mountain. It was like goat trails going up this mountain in this truck. And we got to the very top of this mountain, and this is in like the foothills of the Ozarks. I'm not sure how familiar you are west with Arkansas. Um, not much out there. You've got like the swamps down south. You have the northeast near Oklahoma, the Ozarks up near Missouri. And then the west is more like rice fields and flats by the Mississippi River. So we're more of up in the northwest part of the state in the foothills of the Ozarks. So we get up on this mountain, and it's like a plateau-looking area. It's pretty flat, and they're like, yeah, we're going to make camp here. I was like, yeah, it looks good, good. So we start pitching tents and get everything set up, and while I'm, I'm pitching a tent, um, I happen to look, and there's like a, um, a goat trail, kind of a, a trail that kind of veers back off, and it's about maybe 25, 50 yards from me, and it kind of cuts back to the left down this hill, and I just happened to look up, and I saw something 
kind of hunched over crossing the road about 25, 50 yards in front of me. And it kind of caught me off guard, but it, I mean, it moved so natural. Like I, I don't even know how to describe it. The way it moved, it just looked like it belonged there. Is the best way to the way I tell people. Um, and when it, I, mean, I guess it saw me look at it, and it kind of went faster down the hill. But I wasn't able to see like any facial features. But I did see, for sure, two legs and two arms, and it kind of a curved back. Um, height wise, probably six and a half to seven feet, bent over, and coloration. The best way to describe it is almost like the color of a like cottontail rabbit kind of some brown and gray and some black underlying fur um underneath it and the the sun was definitely shining um off of it so there's no shadows or anything so i i brought it to their attention i was like hey hey i, I just seen something they're like no way like you're brand new to this chad like you've never did this before i've got no clue what i'm looking for i was like no no guys i'm being for real like I just seen something across the road. It was like, all right, well, let's go check it out. So we walk up to the side. I'm like, yeah, it crossed right here. There's There wasn't any tracks or anything. And they're like, well, it must have went back down into this valley. So we, we kind of went down the hill. And into this valley, there's a bunch of gourds and pumpkins that had been tossed in this valley. And uh, whatever it was, it was gone. I was like, well, that's, that's pretty interesting. And they're like, you sure it wasn't a deer? I'm like, no, it's too tall to be a deer. Um, they're like a bear. I was like, no, it wasn't walking like a bear. It was walking way too fast to be a black bear. Um, they're like, so you're sure like it was bipedal. I was like, yeah, I'm telling you it was bipedal hunched forward. Like it was carrying something. And, um, the guy who was leading the camping trip, he's a pretty well-known, um, researcher in the state of Arkansas. I won't, I won't use his name or anything just for privacy. Um, but he's a pretty well-known researcher in Arkansas, was him and his son. And the gentleman said, you know, maybe he was carrying these gourds and pumpkins when we came across it and uh, startled it. And it crossed the road, dropped what it was carrying and took off. So later that night, um, by this time, I think the sighting probably occurred around like noon, one o'clock. And a few hours had passed and we had built a fire. We were cooking some like hot dogs and some different meats and stuff on open fire. And the sun became the set and they were like, all right, you know, it's time for bed. And uh, I was pretty tired because traveling, you know, home on leave, I've been flying a uh, pretty long day. So we decided to go rack out in the tent and um, I heard them talking um, after I fell asleep, I woke up to people talking. They were talking about something down in the valley. And I got out of the tent. I was like, hey, like, what's going on? They're like, well, you know, we heard some some wood knocks. And I was like, well, what, what's a wood knock? And they're like, oh, you know, it's a way they communicate. They beat on trees. They're either communicating or warding something off. I was like, wait, what? And they're like, yeah, if you listen, you can hear it, like, take place down in this valley. And we were high enough up on this mountain that you can look down into the valley and you could see lights if there were cars coming or other campers, and there's nothing out there. I'd say, like, we're, like, the only people out there. And so, sure enough, like, 30 minutes pass, and you hear, you know, clock, 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 just three, like, really hard knocks. And it was probably, it sounded maybe like a mile off, two miles off. Um, and I was like, well, do y'all have, like, guns or anything? And they're like, no, we don't bring guns, you know. I'm like, well, how, how big is this creature? And they're like, you know, they range from six feet to eight feet to some encounters being 12 feet. And like, how much do they weigh? And they're like, you know, they start spitting off all these statistics. And I was like, and y'all don't bring guns with y'all? They're like, no, we're not too worried about it. I was like, whoa, whoa, hold up, hold up. You know, this is getting kind of crazy. Um, so then they, they begin to call the, the guy leading the group. The guy that's a pretty well-known researcher. Um, he begins to do like a series of whoops and like howls. And uh, so he does his call about 30 seconds to a minute goes by and something calls back and it's like a low, like, I was like, what in the world was that? Like I look at my brother, I was like, dude, like what, what was that? He's like, man, that's it. So what I'm talking about, I'm like, "Uh, you know, it could be a bear. It could be an elk. Like, no, no, listen to it again. I'm thinking coyote, you know, there's a series of animals that live in the Ozarks. Nothing I've ever heard. I'm a pretty avid outdoorsman. Um, nothing even compared to what, what that sounded like. I've never heard it before. <clears throat> so a few minutes passed by about maybe 10, 15 minutes. 
and they do it again and it responds back with another and this time it's closer and another 30 minutes passes by they do it again and it calls back and this time it's even closer by this time it's maybe what sounds like half a mile away and so they proceed to do it one more time and it calls back and this time it's probably maybe less than a quarter of a mile and this plateau we we're kind of set up camp on it went down to that valley i was telling you about where we found the pumpkins and it was a pretty steep drop off like anywhere from you know a 60 foot drop to kind of a 30 foot drop um pretty steep so it'd be really hard for a deer or a bear to you know like maneuver through that <clears throat> let alone a human so they call again and this time I mean, it's like right up on us and you can start hearing branches just crack, crack, you know, it sounds like something's stepping in the, the underbrush, the foliage, and you can hear it stomping around and it's like right up on us. And it sounds like it's climbing up this pretty steep embankment and it's obviously pitch black at night and we don't have flashlights or anything shining down there, but it sounds like you can hear it breathing just whoa, whoa, whoa. and it stops. And it, it seemed like, man, like the longest 10 to 15 seconds of my life of just quietness. And it was almost like it, it knew like we were there and it stopped breathing. It stopped moving. And it was like, I don't know if the wind shifted or if it could see us or knew like we weren't what he thought it was. And it just takes off running, just takes off running down this, this really steep embankment. I mean, you can hear it just crash, 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 and just I mean, really going to town on these trees, just snapping branches, taking off. We didn't hear anything the rest of the night. And uh, the group I was with, they pretty much agreed. And they're like, yeah, whatever that was, if it was a Bigfoot, it's not coming back. And um, I was like, yeah, that was pretty, pretty scary. Um, that's not, not cool. <laughs> so we decided to go back to bed and... Um, me and my brother go back to our tent and the guy leading the group, his son, they go back to their tent. Um, about an hour or two passes by this time. It's probably maybe 2 AM in the morning and it becomes a thunderstorm. And it's, this is in the summer, May of 2015. Uh, so the ground itself is pretty dry. So the water accumulates really fast and it'll pretty much a flash flood is pretty common in these areas. So it becomes this really, really big thunderstorm. And I mean, the rain's coming down hard. The wind's blowing. There's thunder, there's lightning, and I'm in a tent. And all I can think about is whatever that was is probably outside right now. And, you know, I wake up to the lightning. And um, in my mind, I'm thinking, like, I'm just waiting on that lightning to crack, get that silhouette or whatever that was, you know, against this tent. And the tent's moving back and forth because of the wind and the rain. And it rains so much that the the tent that the tent we were in, the water started coming into the tent from all the rain coming off the mountain. And uh, the tent stakes we had pitched were starting to get pretty loose from all the, the the water. So I told my brother, I was like, "Hey man, let's get out of the tent. It's about to like flood. We're, we're, there's a good chance we could get pushed off the edge of this, you know, plateau." So we go to our truck and. So I had to sleep in the truck. I kind of leaned the seat back, and he leans his seat back on the passenger side. And another hour passes. It's probably about this time, 3, 4 a.m., and I've gotten maybe an hour and a half of sleep. And I wake up to little pebbles, like rocks. Not really, like, big rocks, but, I mean, significant, it made a sound being flicked at the, the truck. You hear a tink, tink, tink. And I'm just thinking, like, man, this thing's about to send a boulder through this truck or whatever this is doing like my dad's going to kill me when i bring this truck back and it's got like dents all in it and a shattered windshield so i'm thinking you know maybe it's the group we're with maybe they're trying to get my attention um so i look out the window they're still in their tent i don't i don't see anything um it proceeds to happen again tink tink and this went on for about 30 minutes and uh it stopped i remember going back to sleep and then I woke up right around sunrise, around 6 a.m., and uh, I was ready to get off that mountain, I tell you. Like, 
if it would have stormed that night, I'd have probably got off that mountain. But it being that dark, that wet, um, I didn't want to take the truck down the mountain and risk driving off a cliff or something. Uh, so we woke up the next morning and I noticed a pretty significant like hand look looked like a handprint, but like a smudge going across the the driver's window down the the front door of the truck. And it wasn't for me. It wasn't for my brother. I'm thinking like whatever that was that visited us that night, I think it came up to the truck. Um, had really, really like nasty, muddy, uh, dirty handprint all over the truck. Um, we were getting, going off the mountain. So that next morning, it's probably like 7 a.m. We got all our stuff together, and us and the group go down the mountain. And we get maybe 100, 100, 200 yards from where our campsite was. And there are tracks everywhere, like a lot of tracks. And uh, the group I was with, they wound up going back later that week, and they casted a bunch of them. Ever since that moment, Wes, like, I've just been hooked, you know? All it takes is that that one good moment, and uh, you realize, like, hey, this thing's real. Yeah, you had a hell of a night, man, because you didn't really believe in Bigfoot prior to this, did you? I, I didn't. Like, I'd heard stories growing up in Arkansas, you know, like Boggy Creek. Um, growing up, you know, the, the, the elderly people tell you, like, yeah, stay out of the woods. You know, the wood boogers will get you. But you think it's just probably like wives' tales, you know. You don't really consider it too much. Um, yeah, and I mean, before that, like, I had no no knowledge of, of what, what that was or what, what, what it could be, you know. Yeah. Well, take a gun with you. I mean, <laughs> just because yeah. these guys don't doesn't mean, you know what I mean? Yeah, you can know, run into right? a lot more than just Bigfoot out there. And yeah, sometimes they're not the happy, friendly, you know, sometimes when they show up, they're pissed. Especially when you're calling yeah. them, you're banging on trees. Um, a lot of times when they show up, they're not happy when they show up. Yeah. Um, it's almost like, hey, I've been, like, you know, deceived. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot like that. Um, have you gone back to that area? I haven't. No, I haven't. Um, I've, I've tried several times and just part of me, I, I don't know. I think maybe that was like my one freebie, you know, and listening to your show, like I've heard of other, you know, people's encounters and I just, I consider myself very fortunate because that could have went a lot worse, uh, than what, what it did, you know? Yeah. I think a lot of times when they, when you're in a group, they, they seem to be more cautious and that's my opinion. Uh, but they seem to be more cautious, a little bit less apt to come in and really cause a fight, you know, when there's Definitely. more than one people, more than one person. Um, and your brother was with you? Yeah. So my, my brother, he's um, he's going to college to be a zoologist, um, trying to major in like primatology. Uh, so study of primates. And we were talking and he, he kind of got involved with this group. And he's like, yeah, man, like this is, this is real. And I want to be one of the first like primatologists to, to really discover this and, you know, dedicate my life to it. So what do you think that they are, Chad? What do you think Sasquatch is? So based off my research, Wes, um, take it for a grain of salt, you know, from what, from what I understand, from what I've heard, um, I think they're a variant of Gigantopithecus. That's my honest opinion. I think at one time, when the land bridge connected Asia and North America, these group of primates crossed this land bridge into the the North American continent. I think over time they've adapted to whatever surrounding they're in. Because Wes, if you you look at like the Pacific variant, the guys over in y'all's you know side of the the, the country, um, a lot of people have very similar accounts of them being a lot bigger. And certain color variations where you go like down south to where I'm from, you know, Arkansas, Georgia, Florida, Louisiana, you have more of the what they call the wood booger or like the skunk ape variant. And then you have the the East Coast up near North Carolina, you know, up toward Maine and Maryland. They seem to be very like smaller bodied. Um, A lot of people I've talked to here in North Carolina claim they're about six and a half feet. And a seven footer is like a a pretty good sized male. and then more toward the central area of the U.S., um, you have like the grass man kind of variations. So I think just like any other mammal, um, as they kind of progressed over time, they adapted to their area. And I always tell people, it's kind of like deer. You know, you have white-tailed deer, mule deer, uh, black-tailed deer, sick deer, coos deer. They all kind of, you know, adapt to the area they're in, but they all come from the common origin of deer. 
right? I think it's the same with Sasquatch. At one time, they were Gigantopithecus, and as animals adapt and evolve, you know, they, you know, they progress and, and change. So that, that's my honest opinion on what, what I believe they are. Yeah, you know, well, it's it's an interesting take. You could be right. Definitely could be right. They they act a lot like primates, don't they? They a do. A lot yeah. like gorillas, and um, so I mean, I understand when people say that because gorillas will throw things at you. They'll bluff charge you. They'll uh, they're very curious. They'll come in and see what you're doing, and you know, I could see why you go that route. Uh, do you have any plans on going back, even though you haven't been back? Um, I, so honestly, I think maybe eventually, uh, I mean, I'm still in the whole military thing. Um, so it's kind of hard. I don't get to go home very often. Um, but when I do, it's, it's very like time crunch. So I, I think I want, one day I'll definitely go back. Um, just because that area they're in, I think they're going to stay there because it's a very secluded area, middle of nowhere up in the Ozarks. So I don't think they're going anywhere soon. So I definitely think maybe one day I'll, I'll I'll get back up there and check it out. But I'll definitely go with a group of people and definitely bring some firearms with me when I do go. Yeah, it's always good as a precautionary, you know what I mean? Plus, you could definitely. even run into some crazy guy out there where yeah, a yeah. gun would be you nice to know. have, you know? Those, those Arkansas people are crazy. <laughs> well, I won't go. I got an audience in Arkansas. <laughs> I won't go that far. Uh, but <laughs> um, yeah, you'll have to uh, keep me up to date, will you? Let me know if you yeah, end definitely. up going back. I, I'd love to know what happens. And definitely. Uh, it's a terrifying night, man, especially when you don't yeah. really believe it. It's quite the eye opener, isn't it? And you know, I, 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 luckily in the military, I'm, I'm in the position where I get to meet people, like I was telling you the other night, from all around the, you know, the world, all walks of life. Um, and they all have the same stories. It just blows my mind. You know, um, I was in Southeast Asia last year, and uh, I got to talk to a group of Philippines, uh, Filipino Marines, and they all had similar stories of a, a smaller creature, you know, that, that lived in the Philippines. And uh, pretty interesting, pretty interesting group of people I was talking to. And um, definitely like an eye-opener, like, wow, you know, there's definitely something going on when you got people from all around the world and all over the U.S. coming up with stories. Yeah, it is. You know, it's in China, it's in Russia. Um, I get Andy McGrath coming up here shortly. And, I mean, they're in the U.K. They seem to be everywhere. You know, I talked to a guy one time from uh, Vietnam and uh, I was telling him about the different types and, you know, kind of what we have here. And he was like, mm, big deal. We've had that over here for forever. And he started <laughs> talking about what they have over there, you know. Yeah. So it's bizarre. I mean, even Australia, um, yeah. they seem to be everywhere. Some form of type of them, you know. I mean, it may not be yeah, some, the Patterson-Gimlin running around, but some form of type, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, I, I always ask people, um, how many species of ape? do we know of? And they're like, Oh, you know, gorillas, chimpanzees and orangutans. And if you include bonobos, um, but I ask him like, how many species of antelope do we have? Oh, there's hundreds. Okay. How many species of rodents do we have? Oh, there's hundreds. So why is there only three species that we know of, of apes? And I tell people, you know, look at the fossil record. You know, at one time there were, you know, several hundreds of groups of large primates running around. And, uh, you know, I, I honestly think, what what we're finding could be a remnant of those um you know species and a lot of people ask me well you know well, why why are they so secluded why are people want to keep them you know away from other people and you know i think i listened to your show it's been a, a few weeks ago i was listening to one of your episodes and the logging industry you know it, it would be crucial um to the logging industry if we ever discovered a species of ape you know living in our national forest um, it, I think the logging industry is like a, a billion dollar, two hundred dollar industry um, every year. Just imagine like how much money they would lose if we discovered an ape living in the forest. Definitely have a good point. Well, be safe out there, and I really appreciate you coming on and uh, yeah, man, sharing your encounter, man. Thank you again. I appreciate it. Look forward to talking to you, Wes. Well, 
I want to welcome uh, Andy McGrath to the show. He's the author of uh, Beast of Britain, and he also hosts a podcast I didn't know about. Uh, so if you're out there looking for another podcast, it's called Beastly Theories. And That's right. Uh, is it on iTunes, Andy? It is on iTunes. Uh, Podbean is the host, and you can find it on iTunes as well. I got gotcha. you. Beastly Theories, and definitely check out his book, Beast of Britain. Uh, Andy, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Very, very happy to be here. Yeah, I'm really happy to have you here. You know, I was telling you before we went on the air about Claire's account. Uh, it was episode 515, I Shouldn't Be Alive, and she's from the UK. She had an encounter here in California, and I'd made the comment throughout the show. I said, well, what did you think you ran into? Because you guys don't really have Sasquatch in the UK, do you? And I said, I really haven't looked into it, but I, I don't know if you guys have it there or not. And uh, it was one of those moments where you put your foot in your mouth. Literally, the next day, I think every Bigfoot researcher in the UK emailed me and gave me what for. <laughs> and I was like, sorry, guys, I just haven't looked into it. Who cares what I think anyway? But uh, There's nothing like being told off online by a yeah. bunch of British people. <laughs> Most polite telling off you'll ever get. It you. was. It was, yeah. Uh, what got you interested in, in looking into this? I mean, being from the UK... And a caveat to that, you know, I talked to uh, Deborah Hatswell and I asked her to send yes. me encounters from the UK, and and I was I was a little taken back by the amount of encounters that are going on there. But what what got I mean, you into it, Andy? For me, I was kind of late to the the British Bigfoot party. I was um I got into obviously cryptozoology as a, a young teen. I'm 43 now, almost. So. As a young teen, I got into Loch Ness Monster and, and things like that. You know, the Paddy, the Patterson Gimlin footage, all of those regular sit-ins, the In Search of program, Arthur C. Clarke, the whole thing. And um, I collected sightings. And whenever there was something in the newspaper around the world and in the UK, I'd collect the clipping or I'd you know make a an email note of, of what had been seen and investigate it. And I'd been working in centre of London in private healthcare for. 10 years, since 2009 uh, now. But what happened in 2016 is I actually kind of had this, my wife calls it my um, midlife crisis or my 40 fever. I just got really bored. And I wanted to do something different. And she said, you know, what about these monsters that you're into? Why didn't you write something about that? So I said, okay, I'll, I'll look into it. And I'd already been challenged by an American friend before this to, to prove that there were more cryptids in the UK than just messy and, and things like that. And so I had another gauntlet outstanding too. So Lake Monsters was my thing and I started looking to that and other things like unidentified flying cryptids. And I came upon the British Bigfoot. I'd only ever heard of two or three sightings, uh, one of which was accompanied by a, a photograph in 2015. And you know, I was thinking, well, it's a, it's a tramp. It's you know, a crazy person out of the woods. This doesn't sound right. And I had caught the, the Finding Bigfoot British episode before, and I thought they were ridiculous to come here. Um, and yet, you know, here we are with these sightings. And I got in touch with Neil Young, who featured in that program, and, and Deborah Hatswell and others. And I started to find all of these really, really interesting sightings, which to my mind as a, as a Sasquatch fan for so long, all of the descriptions matched the behavior, the appearance of the North American Sasquatch really well. And there was another facet to it that was very uh, interesting, which was that the people in the UK, they didn't have Bigfoot on the brain. So when they described them, they said it was like a giant chimpanzee on two legs or like a huge orangutan with a flat face standing up seven feet tall. Um, and it was, I, was, I thought, well, this is fascinating. You know, they don't have Bigfoot on the brain. It's not a hugely popular phenomenon here. And these people are, are reaching into their mental library of images and animals they know to try to describe something unknown. And this is better than somebody saying, I, I saw Bigfoot, because they never say that word. And it just started from there. And the sightings, as you see from somebody like Deborah Hatswell, has been going for 40 years now, and she's, she's also a witness of this uh, animal from the early 80s. The sightings are in the hundreds, and they're descriptive, and they're mundane. And what's important about them being mundane is they're not elaborate. You know, these are general sightings by people who've got no interest in the subject, who just saw something they couldn't explain. Yeah, I noticed that too when Deborah sent me some of the encounters and I was going through them and listening to the eyewitnesses. 
Um, they don't say Bigfoot and they don't say no. Sasquatch. Um, they'll say wild man or caveman. I heard caveman a lot. Caveman, um, or gorilla, or gorilla, gorilla on two legs. Yeah. yeah, orangutan, chimpanzee, same thing. Um, are you guys, when you collect these reports, are you noticing, uh, like here in the United States, we have, uh, it seems like in different areas, people describe them different ways. Um, uh, are you noticing a lot of that in England that, as far as? Mm, then I have been asked about that question before. That's a little more difficult in the UK because of the lack of Bigfoot on the brain. The descriptions, I don't think, are exactly matching the creatures. They're just the best attempt at describing them. Some, the colors seem to vary from black to that mousy blonde color that you get with lots of gray strips of hair, and you know, running throughout the, I say fur, but running throughout its coat, which is a, a common feature. Even the orangutan-like orangey brown color, the auburn sheen, that's very noticeable. But the color variation seems to be what's most different about them. Most of them, where faces are described, a flat face is described. So something that looks almost like an ape, almost like a human, but has a, a separation of nose and, and mouth. It doesn't have a muzzle, which again is a you know a classic Sasquatch description. So I wouldn't say there were different types. If there are, uh, we don't know about them. We don't have enough information. Yeah, one of the questions that always always comes up, or one of the arguments that always comes up. Um, from a lot of people in America regarding Sasquatch in the UK, which I find hilarious because mm. it's the same people have never been to the UK. Uh, we'll make yeah. this argument, but they'll say there's not enough land um, uh -huh. in the UK for that, and wow. or there's not enough uh, cover for them. Um, you know, and I and I always say, well, we have them in Arizona, we have them in Nevada. Yeah. That's a desert. I mean, there's not a lot of cover out there either. Um, but what what do you say to someone who says there's just not enough land in the UK for these things to be roaming around? Well, this was a, a big question at the beginning. Now, I, I live just on the outskirts of London. So, if, you know, somebody like me would assume that the entire country is is peopled and over-inhabited. And I, I looked into this and I wrote a little blog about it called What's With The Habitude? I wanted to find out what the situation was here in the UK. So, what I found was a, an assessment that was taken uh, in 2012, and it was uh, called the UK National Ecosystem Assessment. So it's a government assessment of the land. And what they were just surprised to discover was that only 6.8% uh, of the UK's land area could actually be classified as urban. And that included rural development and roads. So this was you know, quite amazing. Now, if you know what the makeup of the UK is, you have England, which is the most populated nation, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. Now, in England, what they actually found is 10.6% of England has urban sprawl covering it. 1.9% of Scotland has urban sprawl, 3.6% of Northern Ireland, and 4.1% of Wales. So that's a whopping 93% of the UK that isn't actually urban. It's just... It's unused land. Now, we do have a lot of farmland, but hardly any of that is used for crop growing. Most of it is wild grazing for sheep and cattle and, and things like that. So we've got 33.337 million sheep, thereabouts. Uh, they, most of them uh, graze wild. 4,000 wild boar, 63,000 breeding pairs of Canada geese, and you get an, an extra 192,000 in the winter. And then we have 37.5 million rabbits in in the country. So it's just, and it's, you know, it's, it's overflowing with wild deer and invasive deer species as well. So the, the amount of food in the country and all of the rivers and, and coasts with shellfish and uh, really well-stocked trout and salmon rivers too, it's um, and and hardly any large land predators. You know, this is a this is a really healthy environment. One point I want to add to that very quickly is that British people were not off the path kind of hikers. We've got very few wild campers, so mostly we stick to the path. We don't go wandering off into the wilderness. And so I think there's a lot of space for something like this to to quietly um, survive. Yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't know there was that much open land in the UK. A lot. 
Yeah, a lot. Um, and there is a history of it there, too. That's the other thing. Uh, the Woodwos, um, the Green Man, you know, the Green Man might be more legend, but, you know, legends come from somewhere. Um, and so there is kind of a long history of, of a wild man in the UK, you know, especially in Scotland. They taught, you know, I have a lot of listeners in Scotland. Mm. And when I first got into this, I was like, why, why is so many people from Scotland listening? And then, but there is a long history of it there. Yeah, I was wondering, do you um, do you have encounters you want to share with us? Yes. Uh, talking about Scotland, actually, there's a, a fantastic encounter in Scotland. Now, I was in Loch Ness just in January, and very close to that area, there's a, a place called Straths Bay Forest. It's part of the old Caledonian Forest. Now, one of the people that follows my page got in touch with me. Now, he'd been a primate keeper for 37 years. And him and his brother, they used to go and um, wild camp and do some very sort of basic hunting, rabbits and things, with air rifles, so it was a small arms up in these, these forests in Scotland that used to be their family holiday every year, so to speak. Now, he had an experience. This is back in, I think it was 2012, I'll just double check the date. Yes, 2012, where he and his brother were actually wild camping in this forest. And they'd gone out one, mo- one morning to, to hunt some rabbits and they were creeping along and He'd made his brother stay behind a few steps because he had a really heavy footfall. And suddenly he can't hear his brother walking behind him anymore. So he looks back to see where he is and he sees this look on his face he's never seen before. Eyes and mouth wide open, looking straight past him. Now he looks to where his brother's looking. There's a dark figure crouching down with its down with its back Um to him, and it looks like it's eating some berries, some blackberries from a bush or, or something like that, from the way its shoulders are, are hunched over. And he's around five or two, this gentleman. He's not very tall. And he's saying that the creature crouched down looked to be about that, that height. And then it raises its head a little, turns slightly to the side, as if it's listening, stands up, and turns and looks straight at him. He said it must have been about seven to eight feet tall, covered in jet black hair except for the, the upper chest and face, and the skin was very dark. Um, he did mention his bottom lip actually looked a bit pink, which was quite interesting. Had a wide nose and large eyes, and he said his features reminded him of an older bonobo chimpanzee, only the face was much flatter, especially around the mouth, and it was going bald on top. And he was terrified. He said he looked at this thing, completely terrified. He, he dropped you know, his gun down, um, and stared at the creature did, slowly turned away and walked off into the forest. He turned back to see that his brother was gone. He'd left him, actually. Nice. <laughs> and it run back to the car. And I guess, you know, each of us uh, reacts to a crisis in our own special way in the moment. Who knows who's going to trump up and who's going to run away. But his brother had run away and has not since ever gone back into any forest anywhere. Refuses to. And this gentleman's a primate keeper. He's um, he's got a lot of experience. He's worked in zoos all over the country, and he's a, he's been a consultant for Discovery Channel, different people about primates for years and years and years. This is his whole life, and he was convinced that what he saw was a primate of some kind. It had to be a primate of some kind. Only nothing like he's ever seen before, and it changed his whole life. He became a researcher after that. You know, he really threw himself into it. There you go. Another instance of something phenomenal happening to somebody ultimately well qualified to describe what they're seeing. Yeah, yeah, it is. You know, and, and we get those type of reports here in the United States too. You know, we talked about it being balding. I've heard that on mm. more than one occasion uh, where they appear to be balding. Um, and so he he didn't think it was a hybrid or anything like that. He was pretty convinced it was some sort of primate. That stood out to me about his report, actually. He was convinced that, that what he was looking at was a primate, only a primate that he had never seen before. Where do you get the bulk of the reports in the UK? I mean, w- what area, w- what part of the region do you get the most reports from? I think they're actually very well dispersed around the country. Now, parts of the country are more populated than others. So similarly to the US, we get more reports from from areas where there's more people. And that, to me, I think, uh, indicates some sort of neat or uh, balanced dispersion across the country. 
most of the UK is is the same kind of country. Of course, we've got you know, mountain ranges and more boggy areas too, but it, it's the same kind of landscape as you go through. I would think that the the reports down here in the south are the most numerous, and also in Scotland. Scotland amazes me because it has so few people around that, that the mass of reports there really indicates a large presence. And when you go to Scotland, you visit, you see the landscape and how um, unpeopled it is, how isolated it is. Uh, I think that really makes sense that they could survive there very well. But even in this area, in Surrey, there have been reports of one that I actually investigated personally, it happened again in 2012 in a place called Box Hill. Now, it's a beautiful area. You know, it's, it's, in, uh, it's in the Surrey Hills, area of natural beauty. That's a A-O-N-B. That's how they uh, designate it. And this this beautiful hill that's uh, ascended by this zigzagging road, it's surrounded by miles of countryside, actually has something on it, a little wall called the steps. And these steps, these earthen steps, hemmed in with wood, they probably go down for about seven, 800 feet to the bottom. And there's a little stepping stone sort of river there that you can cross and you know enjoy the countryside. Now, some of the locals, they, they jog it. Some of these crazy people jog it in the summer months. And there was a jogger, 2012. She had been running the steps and near to the bottom, she sat down to, to take a rest. Now, if you've been to this area, they're heavily, it's heavily forested on either side of these steps and they they twist and turn all the way up the hill. So it's very easy to, to pop out of sight very quickly, either into the, the surrounding forests and bushes or just to turn the corner and, and get out of the way. It was still light. That's that's the description she gave us. She hears somebody coming down the steps behind us. She's sitting down. She's having a recovery drink. She moves to the side thinking some dog walker is, is coming past. Nobody passes her. She waits for about 10, 15 seconds and feels uneasy. And so she turns back only to see about 10 meters away a large, maybe six foot plus tall ape man. That's how she did described it um brown and gray fur heavily muscled with a an ape-like conical head but a very flat man-like face and a, and a square large jaw a jaw that looked too big for its head staring at her just looking so you know she's in shock she watches the animal suddenly it turns away and as it leaves the scene She's hit by this stale farm animal-like smell. That's how she described it. Now, of course, we equate that with a, a Sasquatch kind of smell. And it was interesting to me that it happened afterwards as a kind of you know, don't follow me kind of key. Um, before that happened, she'd been running up and down these steps and she'd heard what she later described as wood knock. She said she didn't know what they were at the time, but she heard this knocking against wood for several minutes before seeing the creature. So this area... Surrey, Kent, where there's lots of marshes and flats and, and wildlife to prey upon, it seems to be very, very heavy in sightings. But the surrounding population of these green areas is, is really high. You know, it's, it's very surprising they should be so close. You know, that behavior is, is fascinating, how it would come up and just watch her. And we get a lot of that, too. But we also get a lot of uh, aggressive reports. Um, that is, that is fascinating when it walks off, then she gets hit with the smell as opposed to smelling it. You know, it does make you wonder if it's some sort of defense mechanism that they do, you know what I mean? As opposed to them just stinking all the time. It does seem that way here, actually. There's, there's a few reports that actually talk about the, the stale smell being, being, uh, observed <laughs> to be polite after the animal's left or as it's leaving. Do you have any aggressive reports? I know you'd mentioned yes. a, a bluff charge, but do, yeah, tell me about some of the more aggressive reports that you guys have. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll start with um, what that's very close to the sighting, the Box Hill ape sighting, which took place in, in Dorking, Deep Tea. Now, Dorking is the area that, that Box Hill is in anyway, and uh, this happened in 2016, four years after the, the Box Hill sighting. Now, there were two brothers, and... And there's something that people are doing here where they're exploring old railway tunnels and old government sort of buildings and underground sites. And there's there's tons of caves in the UK, but there's also tons of abandoned tunnels that were used during the war. Now, these particular brothers were uh, investigating an abandoned tunnel in Dorking, Deep Dean. 
in Surrey late one evening in 2016. They heard a noise inside and they, they thought it was other explorers. So they just waited outside for them to finish. And then their two dogs started barking quite fiercely. And they were greeted by a, a really loud roar, which was coming from the trees facing the tunnel. And they heard something very, very big moving in those trees, breaking and snapping branches, going crazy, basically, for about 10 minutes. Eventually, it quietens down, and they're just left there terrified. One of the boys wants to run, and the other says, no, I'm not running with this thing chasing me. Let's just wait here until it stops. And they're just frozen you know, to the spot, uh, hearing something padding about in the undergrowth, but never, ever seeing it. They came back a few days later, and I only wish they knew more about the subject at the time. They found a, a footprint they said was around 20 inches long, and 8 inches wide. Uh, at the top and, and three inches wide at the bottom. Now, if they managed to cast that footprint or get a photo or whatever they could have had at the time, uh, that would be amazing. But that's just one of the one of the examples of bluff charges. There are others, and some have been very, very, how can I put it, very obvious. Now, with the bluff charge, I don't actually think, for the most part, that any... Uh, any harm is intended. To be honest with you. And there have been cases. Now, there was uh, a case in 1986 in Stowe-by-Chartley, near Stowe-by-Chartley Castle, uh, people claiming to see a giant chimp. There were a couple that were driving one evening and driving past the ancient ruins of Chartley Castle in Staffordshire, England. They're forced to break to avoid a huge stag, huge deer crossing the road, and it's followed by what looks like a large chimpanzee to them. It comes bounding after it, halfway across the road, looks directly at the couple, angrily charges their vehicle, breaking off at the last second. Now, husband panics, he tries to reverse the car and stalls it <laughs> and leaves them stranded in the road. And for the next 20 seconds, this thing just continuously charges their car, but doesn't, doesn't attack it, doesn't attack them, then bounds off in the direction of the stag. And I think those are yeah, classic, classic bluff charge um, situations where the creature is saying, you know, you're in my space, you're in my way. You'd better, you better get moving. But no harm actually comes out of it. Yeah, it is interesting. I, you know, the bluff charge. I think you're right. I tend to agree with you, Andy. I, I mean, I think when they do that, it's more or less meant for you to move along. You'll see apes do that or gorillas do that. They'll they'll yep. charge you, and trust me, if they get a hold of you, you're in trouble. But at the last second, they'll break off. You know, almost yep. like it's just wanting you to leave. Did he give any great descriptions on what he saw? I mean, beyond it being a monkey or a chimpanzee? No, large chimpanzee is the it's the only description we have of that one. There was another one in the um, in the Ivy Den uh, area in Hackenthorpe, Sheffield, from the 1980s as well, where some children were chased by a six to seven foot tall creature with very bright red eyes, which they said ran, ran up the stream about 20 feet away from them. And as they were running away... The, creature uh, jumped across the stream and one of them fell over one of the children fell and got up in a panic only to see that the creature had stopped chasing him was just watching him a little distance away so all of the descriptions really i think it's it's part of the shock they mentioned the ape-like appearance or the hairy like appearance or the hairy mad like appearance but there's very very little descriptive um, well, in most cases, especially in these bluff charge cases, very little descriptive detail. Do you notice a difference between like historical accounts and modern day reports? Or are they pretty much like here in the United States, if you read something from the 1800s, a report of the wild man and compare it to something today, it really lines up. Do you notice that in the UK? With the, the wood woes uh, or the wood woes of, of Europe and and. Britain, of, of the Middle Ages especially, you know, the medieval period when people were depicting them on portraits and tapestries and we still have you know, tons of churches where there's statues of them all over the churches adorning the churches. They tend to be mostly depicted as a man that's very large and very hairy, very often carrying a club or a stick of some kind. Um, now, somebody pointed out to me recently that that could just be indicative of the tool they used to make woodlocks, right? Um, but there is a correlation to Hercules and Janus in, in this big hairy man who carries a club. 
So that does have a you know, a godlike history to it as well. It goes back much further than Europe, in fact. So my difficulty with those depictions are is they are mad-like, but then people had not seen apes in this part of the world at that point. So any description, any depiction of what they were looking at would inevitably have man-like features instead of ape-like features. Uh, it's difficult. There are one or two interpretations which look incredibly ape-like, and they're hundreds and hundreds of years old, but they're, they're, in, they're few in number. It's kind of weird they're on churches, don't you think? I mean, if I went to mm-hmm. church and they had a Bigfoot up you know, in the, in the yeah. glass, I'd be like, why is there a Bigfoot on the glass? No one wants statues as well. I mean, these are not, and these are not new churches. These are hundreds and hundreds of years old, eight, eight, nine hundred years old sometimes. Really old places. Yeah, it's just interesting. They were. I wonder if it's for documentation. Normally, when churches put that up, it's a form of worship. So that's weird that they have the woodwos in their churches. You know what I mean? Do you find that strange, or is it just me? Well, um, I don't know in the way that that medieval churches. I mean, it, it, there's a mix of religious superstition and religious um, forewarning in, in lots of churches. Now, I don't really know if they were seen as um, as a bad creature in any way, but they definitely were probably venerated by the pagans, as, as you see in the depiction of the green man, you know, with godlike status, so or with at least a, uh, a sacred, uh, a sacrosanct status of some kind. And that period in history during uh, British church history as well was actually as late as that we were swapping over lots of pagan festivals for Christian festivals, basically transposing the names and the purposes of these uh, festivals onto our own symbolism, you know, Christian symbolism. So I think it's its inclusion is probably to do with uh, stuff that was being talked about or believed about by the local peoples at that time. Uh, but again, it's you know it's so religiously and supernaturally wrapped up in the myth and the folklore of people. It's it's hard to, to really tweeze out the facts and the data from those types of reports and representations. And if you would, um, I want to get back to some of the encounters, Andy. And I really appreciate you coming on. I hope people go to Amazon and check out your book, Beast of oh, uh, Britain, and and I hope people check out your podcast, Beastly Theories. Um, for the audience, I know we mentioned the Green Man, and I've looked into the Green Man, and sometimes people say, well, it's all nonsense, it's it's meant to, you know, like uh, boogeyman type stories, and then you have people who believe in the Green Man. Uh, for the American audience, would you explain what the Green Man is? Yeah, okay. So, <clears throat> the Green Man, it's it's got many variations, actually, and it, it actually features in, in many cultures, but it's... It's related to a, a vegetative deity, a forest deity. It is a symbol of, of rebirth. Now, it, for the pagans, it would have represented the cycle of growth each spring, and um, the mythology would have developed independently from them in, in the traditions of, of the different cultures in and around Europe, too. Its appearance on, on churches and, and things like that, as I said, I, there's a lot of relation and crossover at that particular time, that medieval period between pagan to Christian uh, religion, and lots of things have been superimposed onto the pagan religions. And I think its inclusion in our churches is a lot. There's a lot um, vested in that. A lot of paganism vested in that. Uh, it's basically it's it's a wood deity. I do believe personally that its its description comes from witness sightings of these creatures hiding themselves in foliage. Now, I know you've got Deborah Hatswell on, on here at some point soon. Some of our reports describe, uh, at least at first, when they, they meet eyes with these particular wood woes or, or Bigfoot, they describe looking at the bushes and the bushes look back at me. And that's the first thing Deborah says about a sighting. I was playing at this park with my friend. Suddenly I locked eyes with the bushes and they were looking at me. And then this big creature leaned out. And I think I think it really comes from that this elusive and reclusive nature of the creature, and over time in our societies in Europe, we've inculcated this spiritual meaning of rebirth, and perhaps it's a virile animal. You know, the satyrs and the fauns and all of these precursors to the woodwows had this very sexual, sexualized aspect to them. You know, kidnapping maidens and, and things like that. 
and I, I think it's just about that rebirth. Um, as to whether it directly correlates with the British Bigfoot, I couldn't rightly say. But I do think it has some bearing, or the modern reports have some bearing on what people once saw back then. I gotcha. Well, if you would, I know I want to talk to you about Dogman and some of these other strange cryptids, but do you have any more encounters you'd like to share with us? I yes. love encounters, yes. man. <laughs> I like encounters too. I mean, uh, there was one I have actually, now this isn't a definite encounter, but there's a few in this area. You, you talked about clusters in certain areas. So there's a, a river that's very close to the River Thames uh, in the area of Kent called the Medway. Now, that goes right out there to, to the coast. You know, it goes to the English Channel. It's very flat and marshy. There's tons of fish life and shell life, uh, shellfish life and, uh, oh, gosh, you know, crayfish, crabs, sheep, rabbits, everything around this area. It's really, really unpopulated. It's really flat and after dark, it is black. You can't see a certain thing. So recently, I was called to a friend's, um, a farm where they have a few horses in this area and his wife now he's kind of into Bigfoot actually but his wife had been out feeding the horses very early in the morning now this is at the in the very end of January uh, Monday 21st of January this year it's 8 30 a.m the ground is frozen and at the back of their their horse paddock there is a fence line with some some bush-like trees interspersed along it and they're about seven feet tall most of them and behind that there's a 30-foot drop to a railway line which used to be used for industry but now is no longer used so she's feeding the horses and she notices that they're not going out to their hay bale they just their ears are pointed towards the fence and they're, they're looking that way she sees a large figure walking along and the way she interpreted the walk it was that loping kind of bent forward walk and she's confused like who is this at this time in the morning walking along this this really dangerous fence line and it sees her and it ducks behind a bush now she noticed that the head and shoulders were above the bush it ducked behind before it ducked down the bush was seven feet tall there's head and shoulders above this her dog tore off after the creature and as she went over to have a look it was gone there was nothing there but this area has lots and lots of sightings. Um, there's been creatures spotted running along hay bales. Uh, there was a lady, he took me to her house actually, who lives in a very arid, um, isolated, to be honest with you, um, part of, of the, the medway there. And her caravan has been rocked while she's in it. And there's always large creatures banging along the, uh, the door. She's seen something leaning over a, a minivan, I guess, which is about probably about five feet high and that was head and shoulders above it as well and it just goes on and on you know, encounter after encounter um and these all seem to be within the last seven or eight years it's interesting because the area is it's viable habitat apart from the fact that it is very very flat with very small forest for cover which goes against it one of the things I really like about the the Bigfoot encounters in the UK is the description of behavior. Now, talking about Salford, which is the area near Manchester where Deborah Hatswell had her sighting in the 80s, there's been many other sightings around this area. On the 16th of July in 2016, a, a man was golfing with friends at Ellesmere Golf Course in Worsley when they noticed something seven feet tall, hairy and human shaped with a barrel shaped chest and an odd shaped head hunched over like it was old or injured, and it was making chattering sounds like an ape, swaying from side to side as if agitated, clapping its hands loudly and moving them like it was uh, using some kind of sign language. The group then hears a, a loud wailing coming from another part of the trees, and the creature turns and runs away. Really, I mean, astonishing. You know, this is very, it very is. strange behavior. Um, now, there are some strange people in Salford, Manchester, <laughs> but um, <laughs> none that really match this particular description. And um, I, I think that's a it's, it's very, very stark example. And there is one I'd like to leave you with, which is of a wild man noticed uh, that was observed eating in Bristol. And Bristol's, um, it's in the west of England, you know, very close to Wales. And that was observed in August of 2013. There was a resident of Bristol, and he was uh, walking through Lee Woods Nature Reserve in Bristol. I used to live 
in this part of the country. And I've been through this woods many times. And he saw this creature digging in the earth with a twig, which uh, then dug up something. And it, the creature picked up whatever it was and began eating it. Then used another twig to pick its teeth, wove some twigs together, stood up, snapped a large tree branch and leaned it against another tree and walked off. Commented that the creature was six feet tall, old looking with gray skin. It's very, very strange. That so is, yeah. here you have all of the, you know, the aspects of Sasquatch-like behavior. And uh, yeah, I think 2013, this is before we really started talking about stick structures and glyphs and, and sticklings and things like that. Yeah, you know, a lot of times when people, um, they seem up close, uh, the, not this last one, but the report before that, um, people will say they almost like they talk with their hands. There's a lot of almost like sign language. It's not sign language, but they tend to talk with their hands. That's fascinating. Is there any reports of people getting attacked? I know those are kind of hard to come by because generally the witness is dead. <laughs> I mean, people do go missing, you know, out in the, the wilderness here from time to time. But we've got a pretty good search and rescue here in this country. And it is a small country, remember. So it's not like getting, um, you know, it's not like getting lost in the forest up there where you are. It's if you go missing, somebody's going to come looking. I don't know of any actual attacks that have taken place. People have claimed some over the years, but nothing that I've believed. You know, I, I think whatever this creature is. It's lived here for a very long time with us. We're not a natural food source simply because there is so much food, um, both uh, for an omnivorous creature, which I'm assuming it's an omnivorous creature uh, in this country. It would never really ever have to come near us. And most of the reports that we get, 99.9% as a throwaway figure, seem to be made by people that accidentally spot them. And I always believe it's, it's just a mistake on the part or curiosity on the part of the creature. And and usually for people like myself who go out looking, you know, we never find anything, do we? Yeah, that's the shame of it. One thing I wanted to ask you was, do you get any weird reports, you know, as far as eyes glowing or um, just weird seem to be paranormal incidences related to encounters? There's been some small discussion about the woo and things like that. Quite honestly, was I... Most of the woo reports I've heard have had a, a, a drug-induced component to them. And, uh, and for that reason alone, I've, I've discounted them simply because what have you claimed to see whilst on ayahuasca or uh, any other hallucinogenic drug? It couldn't be claimed to be real. Um, there, have been, there have been incidents, apparently, of, of people thinking that they've melded into the background somehow or they've they've disappeared but never really very clear i i personally think that this creature has the ability to camouflage itself very well and maybe the the interjection of the the grays and the browns amidst this this fur that it has helps it do that but i, I don't think we have any solid woo cases here yeah and it, it might be just with the amount of reports i mean i think deborah's put together what like 500 encounters which is a great oh, yeah. You know, it's a great feat, but in the grand scheme of life, there's more encounters in Washington State than there is in the UK or encounters oh, right. collected. But, you know, I mean, if there's one encounter in the UK, you know, it doesn't really matter the number. If there's just one, um, you know, it's pretty amazing that they're there. And I guess it goes back to the question of what is Sasquatch? If you think it's a monkey, well, then, yeah, it makes no sense it would be in the UK. Um, well, I don't want to say that. Well, let me back up. I see all the researchers getting their emails ready. No, Everyone, no, it's fine. <laughs> I didn't mean it like but that. You're right. It doesn't make any sense. Um, how would it? How would it have got here? For a start, now a lot of people talk about the Doggerland Bridge, which they've proved once existed between the UK and Europe as a as a land bridge. And of course, there's many other terrestrial animals that are here that we used to have bears and and boar and all kinds of things. And there were other animals that are here, like badgers and foxes and, and deer that could not have swum the English Channel. Yet they are here. They've not all been brought across. Now, the one animal we do have that was imported uh, some 2,000 years ago is the rabbit. We never had rabbits until the Romans came. We had hares, um, which is very interesting. But uh, point being, animals get here. We know that the habitat is available and I think the assumption should really be that 
the possibility of the American Sasquatch uh, living here in the UK is not very high because that would be acclimatized to, to that particular environment. But the possibility of another adaptable, intelligent animal that's always lived here, surviving alongside us, almost unknown, I think is feasible. Yeah, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of the reports in the UK that I, I was kind of reviewing, um, they talk about it being six and a half, maybe seven feet tall. I don't know that I read too many that were, it was nine, ten feet tall, you know, like what we get here in the United States. Or or, or are you getting those larger reports? No, very, very few large reports. Some in the eight-foot range. Generally, it seems to be between six and a half feet to seven feet with some, you know, five feet and below reports as well, which could be juveniles or, or could just be a, a smaller uh, specimen. Now, some people think that what we have here is more similar to the Russian Almas than the American Sasquatch. I know, of course, there's you. lots of debate about what that could be, but the few footprints, which are ambiguous at best, but the few footprint finds that we have here they're broad arched footprints. They're not flat. And that's that's another interesting aspect to this. That we're looking at something that's um that's more like the Almas. And I then I think the the term wild man seems to fit far better with what we're talking about then than Sasquatch. I would agree. But of course we've got the you know, we've got the primate keepers report of it being definitely a primate. I would qualify that report, but I would say that in every situation, when you are faced with with something that's strange and unknown, your mind makes up the detail or it, what's most familiar to you. I was thinking about um, or interpreting the extraordinary when you remember things like um, the Aztecs seeing the ships of Cortez in the distance, and they imagined them floating mountains. Didn't they and Moctezuma, their, their ruler, thought Cortez was the god Quetzalcoatl. Because who else could it be? Um, what else could these ships be but mountains? We don't have any other point of reference. And I think the psychological aspect of this is very important. Yeah, it is. Especially when you see one because there's shock, awe, and fear all at once. And well, you've had that experience, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, it, it yeah. is. And it's hard to – that's why I always laugh when people say, well, why didn't you get a picture? It's uh, like that's a last thing on your mind. It really is. I mean – that couldn't be the furthest thing from your mind when you're in that situation. And I think it's different. A lot of times you'll see guys take pictures of UFOs and you're on the ground, you're a little safer. That might come into your mind. But when you're 20 feet away from something, eight feet tall and a thousand pounds, uh, your, your first thought isn't, hey, let me document this. Uh, it just doesn't go no. through your mind. You know, I and might. Or go ahead, Andy. Sorry. Sorry. I was just because um, I was so interested in your sighting and I. I know the story, but it, it was three or it was four? You we guys were surrounded, three. weren't you? you yeah, saw we three. saw three, yeah. I think there was more and, than three, though. And do you think, oh, did they sort of harass the car or did they kind of block your exit? Uh, the bigger one blocked our exit out. Wow. He wasn't um, He wasn't having it. Uh, but they didn't really, I mean, they. The, one came up to the back of the car and growled, but it, they didn't like throw rocks at the car or try and tip the car over. I think if we'd have pressed our luck, they would have, um, wow. especially that big one, because he wasn't playing. Um, and this is before you became interested in the subject at all, right? This is what started you. Yeah, yeah. Now, now I'd been hunting that. I'd hunted that whole area before. Never wow. saw anything, never heard anything. Um, it, Like you said before, it's kind of, um, it seems accidental a lot of times when you have encounters. There's been times where I've gone out with a group and look for them and we find nothing and there's other times where it seems like when you're unprepared for it they show up you know when you're least yeah. expecting it That's strange isn't it i wonder if there's something in our body language that that's a visual uh, that just Could shows be. that we are off guard uh, essentially um now what's interesting to me about sightings of, like like he had is the psychological aspect. And I'm always thinking about this. So in that moment, while that's happening to you, do you think there was anything that you did that provoked them to come and uh, come and uh, harass you? Or do you think part of their character is, is to get you on the way out? You guys were leaving, right? And suddenly it's like, okay, now's the time. Because it's almost, 
the fleeing animal is the one that gets chased, right? No, we weren't leaving. Uh, we were going to drive down. We were arguing at the time. We were going to drive uh-huh. down a um, um, basically a game trail road, you know, and it's two o'clock in the morning and I don't want to drive down it because I don't want to get stuck. And so I think what happened is we blocked our way out. I think they were going down to the water, uh, down to the uh-huh. river, and I think we blocked them on their way unintentionally. And I think it pissed them off that we They're- would stop right there. Wow. It was just a surprise to see you, clearly. Yeah, it was a surprise for us, too. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. I wanted to uh, ask you, when you were in, there might be one day where I might go to the UK and crash your guys' party. Uh, <laughs> You're very welcome. I wanted, yeah, I, I'd love to, uh, I'd love to visit. You know, everyone always wants to go to London. I'd love to see London. Um, but if I were to come to the UK, and for the listeners who are there now, where would you go after all the encounters you've heard and you looking into this? Where would you go to try and find them? I, I'd have to agree with Claire and say Scotland. I think Scotland is still the wildest and most unpopulated, most pristine area of the UK. And to give you an example of this, recently I was in Loch Ness. Um, there was a sighting late December. Uh, with a great picture, and I went to Fort Augustus, which is at the very end of Loch Ness, as you get to the River Oik, that's the end of the loch. And I was there looking for for Nessie, essentially. Now, I decided I was going to walk the whole area. I walked along the um, the Caledonian Canal to the next loch, and I walked up the Alton Creche path into the forests, um, across the Great Glenway at the top. And Loch Ness, you have to understand, they get about 250,000 visitors a year. And yet at nighttime, there's barely a light around the loch. It's still pristine. The biggest village, which I was actually staying in, Fort Augustus, has a residential population of 600 people in this massive tourist area. And that's one of 31,460 lochs, which which are all surrounded by forests and countryside. So it's just this this amazing place. So you have all of the things, you have food, cover, water, as they say, as Bobo used to say, have all of those things uh, available to you. Now, I went for a big hike, and I apologize for anybody who's hear me tell this story uh, a few times recently. I went for a big hike along the Alt Creche Way, which is about, it's about a four-hour walk, I think. I didn't know it, but the path was clear, and it's mostly uphill, up onto the little mountainside there. I've been walking through this thick forest for about two hours, and I got to the top, I saw the lock, I thought, it's beautiful, let's let's go back down. And now along the way, there were two trees that were very clearly felled across the path. Now, this is January, so there's no tourists there hardly. Nobody's doing this walk. And I thought to myself, well, look, you know, there have been high winds in the area recently. That's, you know, let's just call it that. But they were pushed down by the root balls. At least it looked that way. And I start coming down the other side. I'm going down this steep inclination. There's these waterfalls. And I'm very low down to the ground photographing them. And suddenly, in the corner of my eye, I see what seemed like a figure dash behind a tree. Now, I hadn't heard a deer, a bird, anything, a rustle in the whole three hours or so I'd been up there at that point. And suddenly I thought to myself, wow, okay, so you want this situation. And now you've got an hour and a half or thereabouts to, through forest to get back down to where you started and if this isn't you know a happy a happy um meeting here this is going to be very bad for you do you really want it and uh, it's, a, it's a frightening thing but i elaborate I, I digress but the point was i didn't see anybody in that the whole time i was up there in this popular tourist destination scotland has got it and that's that's where the people are you know, that's the kind of uh, wilderness that's available there. Um, you go push out even further into the, the rest of the um, the highlands, and it's just fantastic. I, I would spend a year up there if I could. I would. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, and I forgive my geography, but what kind of a what kind of a trip is that from like London to Scotland? Well, you can fly there. In about forty-five minutes. Oh, really? Or you wow. can take the um, you can take the Scott Flyer from um, from uh, Euston, 
uh, which will take you about 13 hours uh, on the train. They have little sleeper compartments in them you can pay for. It's terribly expensive. Uh, it's about £250 one way, I think, for the sleeper compartment. Or you can stay up all night in one of their cheap seats yeah. <laughs> at yeah. the back. Um, I took the train, actually, this time. I should have taken the plane if I'd thought about it. Uh, but it's a it's a beautiful journey on the way up to really really gorgeous. I definitely would love to see it. I wanted to ask you about uh, Dogman. You know, we get these yeah. reports here in um, in America, and for the longest time, I struggled with it because I was like, I don't know, an upright run around dog. And then when you start to talk to eyewitnesses, after eyewitness, you know, you're talking to so many people, uh, you find they're describing the same thing. The behavior is the same. Um, do you guys have any dogman reports in the UK? We do, we do, and to me, this has been a, a really difficult um, thing to get used to as well. Actually, primarily because it's one of the subjects that makes me realize how people feel when I first talk to them about Bigfoot, <laughs> because I I suddenly fall into the position of well, that's kind of outside my scope of what I'm prepared to believe. You know, yeah, we have. Gigantopithecus, Paranthropus, you know, Australopithecus, whatever we might attribute to Bigfoot in the fossil record. Loch Ness Monster, maybe that's a plesiosaur of some kind, who knows? We've got stuff we can point fingers at. And all we have to ascertain is whether it still exists or does exist. But it's, you know, it's around with the dogman, some sort of canine that either has dog legs and walks on it, you know, walks on two of them, or has a mad like body with a dog like head. It seems insane. But what I had to accept here in the UK is that the people making those reports were delivering them in exactly the same way the people who were making Bigfoot reports were. There was the classic mundane details that you can't forget when you've had this traumatic experience. You know, I'm walking down the street. I see the street light is out. That doesn't normally happen. And then this door slams. And then I see this creature. You know, things that are not necessary to the story but remain because of your shock. We had what I investigated uh, recently. This was first reported on by Linda Godfrey. Actually, I found a, a further report I was really happy about uh, in the area, and it's called the Werewolf of Camberwell. And it was um, it was actually first encountered by a man, October 9th, nineteen ninety six. He was en route to see a friend. He took a shortcut through Camberwell Old Cemetery to, to save time. Now, just to tell you about Camberwell Old Cemetery, it's you know it's it's not in use anymore. We just have 300,000 bodies buried there. Um, first opened in 1856, I believe. And it has something like 10 acres of um, a forest within it. It's it's a wooded kind of place. And it's the middle of an area that also has lots of other parks very close by. Cater Park, Wells Park, uh, Crystal Palace Park. So there's lots of connecting green highways that, that something could use to, to move around. Uh, anyway, so... He's walking through the graveyard. He's cutting through, and um, something really huge grabs him by the arm, smashes him into the ground. He looks up. He sees a uh, a large creature, dark fur, head like a German shepherd dog, looking at him, slobbering and growling, sniffing his body up and down. And then, in a second, it runs off on its hind legs. And he says that he believes he was spared because he suffers from a disease that dogs can smell. Really? And his... His belief is that's why the creature left him alone, and it's that in you know you know witness reports in the witness report that's such a a triggering, that's such a triggering uh, uh, detail. Why would you include that detail? It doesn't matter, unless of course it really happened to you. Yeah, that's fascinating. Makes you wonder. Um, I wonder what that thing is, man. You know, we, here in the in the states, we uh, it appears to be physical, but then it does other things that. Doesn't seem physical. Um, but what other dogman reports do you have? That last one was fascinating. Well, I'll I'll tell you some more now. But I just just to to finish off that last um, sighting, I also once I published this sighting, I I had on this one an, an expedition to this area and, and photographed the graveyard. Somebody, an Irish lady who lived in the area, contacted me to say that her and a friend were walking past the graveyard in two thousand and five. They could hear some loud growling, and they saw a tree being shaken incredibly violently, like a large tree being 
shaken and she thought it was going to be ripped out you know it really looked as if it was going to come down and they they were terrified they ran away from the area and that was the same graveyard now that's not a sighting but i don't know of any british animal that can shake a tree um especially not that way but moving on to some other sightings now there's one i think was which is very very significant. I've never known what the veracity of it is, but it it does look like an aggressive sighting. And people talk about that with these creatures. This was in Poulton Mill. Um, now, three workmen they're, they're driving up to storage blocks in this area to get supplies, and they see a seven or eight foot tall upright wolf man jump down from a roof in front of them and chase their car. They reverse and they they drive off. They never come back, basically. And it's you know it's it's really a terrifying experience for them. There was also a sighting in, in Mount Snowdon, which is in Wales, where I come from, where a woman claimed to have seen a, a dog man whilst hiking around Mount Snowdon in North Wales. She said it was over six feet tall, standing up. It was a man who looked like a dog. He leapt over a fence uh, from a standing start and disappeared. Which I think is, is, quite, uh, yeah, it is. is quite significant. Now, the most famous one is the werewolf of Hull, or the old stinker, as it's... Um, referred to the old stinker old stinker you might have heard of that one <laughs> no no i haven't um, please go oh on. no i mean but it's again it, there's another key little element there it smells clearly and that's a it's one of the things we key into here now this particular oil sighting took place in 2016 there were several sightings in the space of a month or so um and a very famous paranormal researcher here michael vell he was actually actively searching for the creatures that went along I think another claim to fame is Alice Cooper was asking around for sightings of the creature during the whole, you know, during the whole um, shimwuzzle. So, it's 2016, and Hull is in East Yorkshire in England. That's where we get the, the saying, I've been to Hull and back from. Um, and the first sight is made by a local woman. It describes it as running on two legs and on all fours and resembling a human and a wolf. Later, a couple say that they saw they see something uh, tall and hairy eating a dog next to a drainage channel. Uh, they claim the creature jumped over an eight-foot-high fence with a dead dog in its mouth. Um, and I, I think the dog was allegedly an Alsatian dog. I, I, I can't actually uh, clarify that detail. Another woman walking her dog spotted something half dog and half human and said her dog refused to go any further along the path they were walking down. As to why that would be a problem, I don't know. And in August 2016, a woman who was an animal rescue worker was driving through the East Riding village of Halsham with some friends when they all saw a creature on all fours walking towards the car on two legs. Uh, she described it as looking like a big dog, probably bigger than my car, covered in cream and grey coloured fur, but with a human face. And oh. I think I mean, that's not all of them, but that's a, a fair percentage of detailed sightings they are less just like the american stories they are in far less number than those of bigfoot but yeah. um, they do seem to be animalistic in some way they do appear to be some kind of animal at least in behavior i, I would agree with you on that and they are a lot less here than than a sasquatch encounter um very few people will and most people who see them don't don't come forward as far as the dog man goes <laughs> What do you think that Dogman is, Andy? I'm on, honestly, I'm completely puzzled by it. Now, I like to, to to make things make sense to me. You know, when I hear about people doing their 10 types of Sasquatch and Dogman and all these different things, I like to imagine that somehow it's another kind of Bigfoot. But with the snout, just as you might have with different apes and, and monkeys with different face shapes. But perhaps this is what we're looking at. But unfortunately, for the most part, apart from the humanoid figure in some instances, what people are describing is something that looks like a very large dog on two legs. I think it's it's a creature we don't know about, but we do have werewolf sightings going back thousands of years. And that's actually it goes throughout the entire history of humankind, you know, from Anubis to, um, you know, this pagan like ritual of dressing up as wolves and committing ritual sacrifices as, as Caligula used to do. It seems to be entrenched. Um, I often wondered whether the, um, 
the Wendigo of North America was influenced by that ritual as well in some way. I know it doesn't quite represent that, but you know, this cannibalistic kind of creature, this this change changeling, skinwalker lichen. It's hard to tell from history because all of our history is really, really steeped in a supernatural, superstitious belief with this thing. I think our immersion into Christianity and our or leaving paganism behind has, has left over this this relic. And whatever the animal was in its first incarnation became something like a, a moral parable of of, um, of sorts. But there are modern sightings. So what do we do with those? Yeah, it, it's you don't know what to do with them. You know, a lot of the uh, dogman reports, like here in in America, what you'll find is. I don't know what the right word to use. Kind of a, you you almost find a demonic type of behavior. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is this. um, A lot of reports I've had where people have taken shots at them, you know, have shot guns at them. And then they'll take, they'll leave, they'll leave the area and they'll go home. And all of a sudden the creature's at home. That's what I mean when I say demonic, you know, like you go to a ghost hunt and then all of a sudden you go home and the ghost you were at the ghost hunt now is at your home. That's kind of how the dogman is. There's a lot of reports, you know, of cops seeing them. Uh, there's one I had on the show where a guy, his aunt was telling it. He was a cop in uh, Texas, and he had stopped a bunch of uh, uh, Mexican guys, and they were screaming Lobo, 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 which is wolf in Spanish. Uh-huh. And he looked over and he said this wolf was on two legs walking towards them like a man. But yeah. just looking like a wolf in its entire body, uh, wolf-like legs. Yeah, but upright, wolf. walking, yeah. you know, on two legs. But yeah, pretty uh-huh. much like a wolf. And he said bigger than a wolf, but uh, he said the head of a G- German shepherd. And I guess he had taken out his pistol and he shot it three times and it didn't go down. And so he got in his patrol car and he left and he was telling his aunt that it's following him. Every time he goes down that road, it's there. It's following him. So he started sounding par- paranoid. The, the strange part is the guy wasn't an alcoholic. He wasn't a drug addict. He had spent his whole life just wanting to become a cop. Mm-hmm. And that was his whole focus. He wanted to help the public and really make a difference in the world. After this incident, became an alcoholic and eventually died from alcoholism. Because wow. um, he was so terrified that this thing was going to get him. But you'll find that a lot with Dogman reports to where they just tend to show up and they tend to focus on one person like have an interest in one person. Um, and generally, they're pretty aggressive accounts. I mean, they're not... Yeah, I mean, most of ours seem to be aggressive, but I often wondered if, if the perceived aggression was more wrapped up with the fear of the, the creature's appearance. Could be. I, I think, um, you know, a lot of times people, uh, when they come across a creature, it is growling, snarling, and it acts like it wants to kill you. The strange part about Dogman is there's a physical aspect to it, and then there's also another side to it that isn't physical. And I don't know if that's spiritual or, or what. It's um, it's a real puzzler. I mean, with something like this, you've got a history that's largely folkloric and supernatural in, um, in the way it's presented to us. But we also have modern reports. And of course... You know, Dogman essentially is just another name for the werewolf, isn't it? I, I wrote a little blog. It's a chapter in my book. It says, Dogman rebranding the werewolf. You know, how we've come to rebrand this animal into a less embarrassing way to talk about it. Because when you say werewolf, you're definitely talking about the supernatural. Yeah, as far as our history is concerned, that's what we're talking about. But the tales of this type of creature, similarly to Bigfoot, do appear nearly all over the world. So it's either... Either something that's wrapped up in a religious, um, by that I mean supernatural context, or it's you know it's a creature that's been interpreted as such for a long time. Now, when it comes to supernatural abilities, we have to remember things. You know, when the first person who saw, I always talk about this actually, first person who saw uh, uh, an octopus camouflage itself against a rock would have assumed that was some kind of magical power, without the science to understand how it happened. Um, so I always try to think of things from that way. If it acts like an animal and looks like an animal, let's assume it is an animal until we know any better. And I, I think that's where our own particular worldview comes into into real context. You know, I come from 
quite a Christian background, so I'd have that that worldview about it. And yet, somebody who's more um, into the paranormal has a more of a spiritualist leaning might think it's a benevolent or a malevolent ghostly creature. And then the more scientific among us will say, well, this is a relic of supernatural times when people are just invoking this in their minds out of fear, you know, the frail brain excuse. Yeah, it could be. There, there is some strange things that go along, I know, like with Bigfoot and, and Dogman here in the States to where it kind of leaves you scratching your head like, I don't, I don't know what to think about that. And then you hear it over and over and over again. Um, you're just not sure what to make of it. You know, much like Bigfoot, really, what is Bigfoot? No one really knows. You know, same thing with Dogman. No one really knows. Sure as odd, everyone's pretty consistent on what they're what they're saying they saw. And, you know, in the UK, there is, I mean, you guys have it all. Dogman, weird cryptids, Sasquatch, uh, alien reports. Uh, yeah. A lot of this strange large cats running around. I remember the first time someone said that to oh, me, God. I thought, mm, big deal. We got cougars the size of me out here running around. But then I was looking, really starting to look at it. And I was like, wow, those are some big cats out there running around. I don't know what that thing is. Like black, you get a lot of black cats. And um, I'm actually there. working on a, a concept uh, piece about it at the moment, about the big cats. Now, the reason we have the big cats is very, that's very, very easy, really, to to ascertain. During the 1970s, 76, we, you could own any big cat or any sort of dangerous animal that you wanted without any preconditions to doing so. And there may or may not have been some incidents and the UK government brought in something called the Dangerous Wild Animals Act, which meant that you had to register any dangerous animal, keep it in a specific condition and maintain that. It was expensive for some people. And a lot of people, and I've been told directly by some people, that they let them go. Um, mostly people would collect things like melanistic leopards. And that was popular because it was all black or pumas or mountain lions. And um, those are the two most commonly reported, the black ones, the melanistic leopards being the most uh, frequently reported, then pumas after that. They're the most frequently reported animals. And it's throughout the entire country, throughout the entire country. And that really? makes sense because, of course, they need a large territory to hunt. So they would breed and spread out, spread out, and spread out. Now, it's not just from one or two pairs. Lots of people seem to have let them go. And uh, there's also one or two cases where people are describing very large cats that seem to look domestic in the way, with their pointed ears and things like that. And yet they're large, like a big cat. You know, maybe not like a, a leopard, but, you know, something like two foot high and, and four foot long. So there's... <sighs> These reports, they're filmed all of the time, they're photographed, and the people that see them, they're just so regular. I'll, I'll tell you about one of them. I won't go into it too much, but there was, there's a place called Ruspa, which is near to Surrey, where I, where I live, and there was a horse breeder, and this was at the end of 2017, uh, about 9.30, I think it's um, 27th of November. So she and a friend were driving to this farm to pick up their hay consignment for their horses. They had a Land Rover and a you know a little truck on the back. Now, this is a deal where you just pay like a monthly fee. Nobody's at the farm. You go, you pick up your consignment, you drive away. That's how it works. Nobody's there to greet you. And she parks up in the yard. She's got her beams on full about, I think, about 40 feet away. She sees an animal the size of a Great Dane but much heavier build, definitely male. She said she saw it close enough to see it was a male. It's around four foot long with a three foot tail, um, curved at the end. And she said the thickness of its tail was approximately as thick around as her wrist. And she thought it could have been, you know, it, it could have been very, very heavy boned or good boned, as they say in horse terms, a good boned animal. Now, this animal just looked at them and sauntered casually, walked towards them as if there was no issue whatsoever. And shortly before it got towards them, they'd already jumped in the car at this point, headed off into one of the hedgerows and disappeared. At this area, this is about 10 miles from my house, everywhere, all over the place. And they seem to be surviving in our countryside very well because there's so much to eat and very few predators that there haven't been any attacks on people. No, no intentional attacks anyway. As far as I know so far, there was a friend of a friend's that was attacked in the 90s in a place called Tintin uh, by 
a panther, as, it, as we um, label them, in in a field there. Now, Tintin is sort of between Wales and England, uh, in the Wye Valley. And um, I have a good authority by a friend of his that he actually, he was a bit of an idiot and he'd seen it in the field and pulled its tail. <laughs> and I turned around and swiped him in the face and ran away. And he just had like a long scratch along his face, but it was clearly a defensive injury. This wasn't an attack. There was another case of a man in Croydon, uh, which is just outside of London. You know, this is very close to London where a man had heard his cat being attacked in his garden and, and ran out only to see a, a very large cat on top of it. And when he tried to save the cat, it pounced on top of him, gave him a few hits in the face and made off. And he thought it was something like a puma. And you know, that was that. Those are the only two attacks. So you think um, the, the large cat is more, it's explainable as opposed oh yes. to, it's not some it's, weird cryptid out there running around. It's no. Yeah. It's not a known. It's I mean, there may be some cryptid species of them now because there would be limited numbers to interbreed with one another. There have been some, as I say, panther-sized cats described with very pointed, domestic-like ears, um, which, to my mind, could be a cross between a lynx or a panther. I don't know what the the biological um, abilities of these animals are to interbreed with one another. So I don't want to make an assumption on that. But I think it as <laughs> They're an out-of-place animal. I call them upas. They're out-of-place animals. They're not cryptids. I gotcha. Still terrifying, man. The pumas oh, yeah. run in the countryside. I mean... Listen, uh, when I'm out there, I'd rather meet uh, a Bigfoot than a big cat, that's for sure. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, the other question I want to ask, Andy, is, you know, over here in the States, we get a lot of uh, people talking about balls of light or seeing balls of light in the forest. Not Not, not like UFOs, but actual balls of light. Do you ever get reports of those in the UK? There are forest lights. Um, I don't personally investigate them, simply because everything that I, I look into, I try to look into things that are naturalistic, at least appear to be animals of some kind. Um, there are some people who assert that these lights, these um, these orbs or these lights are some sort of precursor to Sasquatch visitations or other visitations, I think it's um, wishful thinking for the most part. Just the same as when we're looking out there and you know you go on some of these Bigfoot pages and all you have is pictures of sticks and rock piles, right. you know, <laughs> uh, forever and ever and ever. And that's not to say that there does seem to be some corroborate, corroborating evidence that they do make some sort of structures at some point. But you know, the, if a tree falls in the forest, the old saying is did. Bigfoot push it down, or do trees just fall in the forest? Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and every time I'm out there and I'm filming, I'm, you know, I'm saying, oh, look at that big X there. Just so you all know, that's a natural <laughs> formation before we start fighting. The, I think it's, um, I think people do see them. I don't know what the answer is to these forest lights. It does seem to correspond with something we would call Will o' the Wisp in our, um, in our folklore. Um, and I wonder if, if this is where some of the fairy stories come from, from time to time. Um, it's, uh, what is it, Will of the Wisp? It's said to be a sort of a supernatural um, atmospheric ghost, like a light that's seen by travelers at night over bogs and swamps and marshes, which to me, again, seems to indicate it's some sort of natural phenomena, you know, because those are swamps and bogs and marshes. They're very active aren't they you know so maybe some sort of lights can come from that you might know it's a um a jack-o-lantern yeah or a fryer's lantern uh it's the same type of thing basically uh but it's i think it's alleged to be some kind of sprite now in our history it would lead travelers off to the forest and get them lost in a bog or you know where you'd sink and die basically so not supposed to be uh particularly good things but i'm I'm no expert on those, unfortunately. Yeah, it's that's what the Native Americans will tell you. Don't follow the lights because they'll lead you off yes. to your death or lead you yeah. off to uh, be lost. But, you know, it's hard to say what they are. It's just strange people see them. And, you know, it's uh, what are these things? There's so many weird things going on in, in this world. Um, what, what do you think Sasquatch is, Andy? What's your opinion? I'm 
I'm completely flesh and blood on this. So I, I think that the Sasquatch and its variants throughout the world, whether that be the Yeren or the Yeti or the Yowie, the Woodwows, um, uh, Rangpendek, etc., they are a form of higher primate. Um, Gigantopithecus, I think, is a good, is a good if the creature looks like we assume it looks. Remember, we've only got some you know jaw bones and teeth and things like that. The same for the Denisovans and Paranthropus. But if they do look the way that we imagine them to look, I think the fossils we have are good candidates for them. And I think they have variations throughout the world, uh, just in the same way as I would think about bears. Essentially, you know, I have a polar bear, a black bear, brown bear, panda, moon bear, sun bear, whatever. And yet, they are all distinguishable as bears. You know, whatever shape and form you find them in around the world, I think it's a it's just a form of very elusive, quite smart primate that we've yet to discover. I gotcha. Well, you know, and and like I said, I hope you're right. I really do. Um, oh, me too. And <laughs> I like that better than you know um, other things that it might be. You know, I'd rather be some sort of uh, animal we haven't been able to catch yeah. up with. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, and, and for the audience out there, check out Andy's book, uh, Andrew McGrath. Uh, I hope it's okay. okay I've been calling you Andy. Andy, that's how I go by Andy. Do you? Okay. Yep. I do prefer that. Andrew watches trains and collects license and plays numbers. And Andy, he's, he's a bit more fun. <laughs> <laughs> but check out his okay. book, uh, Beast of Britain on Amazon and definitely check out his podcast Beastly Theories uh, Andy if, if someone wanted to get a hold of you to talk about what they've seen how would they do that well you can go to my website www.beastsofbritain.com and there's a, a place there where you can leave a sighting uh, you can also find me at facebook.com forward slash beasts of and I'm always active there. And if anybody even wants to get in touch just to chat about stuff, ask questions, or just shoot the breeze, you'll find that um, I'll always get back in touch with you. You might have to stop me talking, but I will definitely reply to your email. Yeah, perfect. Well, that Beast of Britain, that's such a cool name. But Andy, I appreciate you coming on and sharing. I hope people go out and get the book. Uh, definitely check out Beastly Theories on your podcast player. And uh, thanks for coming on, brother. I really enjoyed talking with you. I had a wonderful time. Thank you. There it goes. Andy McGrath, Beast of Britain. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Until next time, everyone. 